a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. It is with this phrase that one of the most famous modern science fiction stories begins. Who, after reading these ten words for the first time, did not look up at the night sky more intensely? After all, we live on one of the many little rocks that make up this infinite cosmos. There must be more than just what we see. For centuries, philosophers and scholars have looked at the stars in search of answers, of signals. Our species has performed endless research on space and the solar system. And yet all this has not been enough to resolve the Hamletic doubt. Are there other forms of intelligent life in the universe? Perhaps all these centuries of admiring and studying the stars have prevented us from noticing the Earth and questioning our origins. Perhaps the answer has always been in our own human history, even in our genetic code. Throughout the course of history, there have been infinite civilizations that have followed each other, fought, destroyed and created. Infinite thoughts and cultures were born and died, without leaving any trace in the sands of time. History teaches us that events are often cyclical, and that in the end, man is more opinionated than wise. Even today, we believe we have all the answers we want, to the point of pushing us not to question the facts that are taught down and handed to us. Over the years, historical studies and archaeological excavations have helped us to find some pieces of the puzzle of our history. Useful and important pieces that, however, do not complete the work. There are still many gaps, and perhaps we are not ready to receive the answers that would help us to fill them. Mysterious archaeology, or pseudo-archaeology, are generic terms referring to all those activities related to the science of the past that reach conclusions rejected by the international scientific community. These terms are often associated with the investigation of bold theories, often unsupported by evidence and consequently not accepted by academia. If these theories were true, they would totally change our perception of the world, of space and of the meaning of life itself. The origin of mysterious archaeology can be traced back to the work of the American Charles Fort, who devoted his life to the collection and cataloguing of all those newspaper articles that reported strange facts, impossible objects and incredible discoveries, ranging from national sciences to archaeology. Fort eventually came to the belief that all of Earth's history has been directed by a mysterious alien power.
there has to be a key capable of providing an answer to the archaeological mysteries that prevent us from having a complete view, an unequivocal answer to the doubts that have arisen in front of creations such as the Nazca Lines, Stonehenge, Yonaguni and the Pyramids, mysterious and diametrically opposed places scattered all over the earth. Infinite are the number of travellers who over the centuries claim to have seen spheres of light or fire moving in the sky. Infinite are the representations of celestial gods descending from clouds or flying chariots. During numerous archaeological excavations, objects have been found that appear to be out of place, the so-called oop art, out of place artifacts representing a historical anachronism and difficult temporal collocation. These artifacts are able to put scientific theories and consolidated historical knowledge in serious difficulty. One of the many peculiarities of these objects is their vast diffusion. They are scattered all over the globe and are part of different cultures and geological eras. Leaving aside the numerous denied cases of false artifacts or simple urban legends, we are faced with a series of relics of immense historical and cultural value. The term artifact should not be misleading. It does not just refer to individual objects, but also to real historical monuments with mysterious construction, or even a particular composition of the materials they are made of. Peru. In this western South American nation, among the undergrowth of the mysterious and deep Amazonian forest, numerous civilizations and cultures originate, one of which being the Caral, the oldest civilization of the New World. Developed around 3000 BC, its nerve center is the city of the same name, whose area extends over 607,000 meters squared which, with its numerous residential centers and temples, was a real ancient metropolis. The distinctive trait of this ancient Pearl of the Andes lies in its 20 pyramid complexes, dated as ancient as the Egyptian ones. The main pyramid, Pyramide Mayor, is the size of four football fields and 18 meters high. Also noteworthy is the fact that no signs of wars, battles or weapons have ever been found in the ruins of the city. It is also important to underline that according to numerous studies, the ancient Karal pyramids were also maintained and preserved by later populations, including the Incas, as if to maintain a certain cultural continuity. It would therefore not be foolhardy to assume that the answers to the mysteries left behind by the Corrals may be hidden within their descendants. In the Peruvian hinterland, we find the Nazca Lines. Even before the glorious Golden Empire of the Incas, the Nazca civilization existed. On the banks of the Aya River, the capital Cahuachi was built whose translation curiously means place where the sighted live. It served mainly as a ceremonial centre for events that perhaps included macabre human sacrifices and terrible mutilations, according to the testimonies reported on the famous polychrome ceramics. A further aura of mystery about this civilization is cast by the famous Nazca Lines, carved into the ground of the Nazca Desert, an arid plateau that extends for about 80 kilometers. The more than 13,000 lines form more than 800 drawings, created with maniacal precision. The grooves never exceed 60 centimeters and the proportions are well respected, as if the drawings were to be seen from the skies. These impressive geoglyphs include stylized outlines of animals commonly found in the area, 
and also of human and anthropomorphic creatures, among which stands out a mysterious astronaut. The latter is clearly the most mysterious and singular geoglyph, since it presents evident stylizations of the real elements that make up the equipment of a modern astronaut, such as the helmet and boots. How could such an ancient civilization know about such elements and forms? The most rational and naive answers fall within a minimum of logical reasoning, since the Nazca, with these signs, were indicating the way back for the gods of the sky. Specifically, the one who is known as the legendary hero master Viracocha, also known as Quetzalcoatl. If it is true that these forms and elements were drawn from what the populations had actually seen, it is not therefore risky to believe that these lines could conceal an even more hidden meaning. In fact, according to the local stories handed down by the descendants of this ancient civilization, these lines are nothing more than a means to communicate with a mysterious celestial body, the home of all of the gods. It is no coincidence that this desert population worship deities able to irrigate their crops, just as it is no coincidence that water was also perceived as a powerful destructive means. All ancient religions and cultures in their respective mythologies speak at some point of a great purifying flood induced by one or more celestial deities. The conservation of these lines is equally suspect since they are almost unchanged from the time of their creation, as if it were necessary for them to remain this way to be understandable in the present day. It seems that the geographic and meteorological culture among the Nazca was extremely advanced, allowing them to choose a plateau that would remain arid over the centuries to come, but how could such an ancient civilization have such prophetic knowledge about the future of the atmosphere? Could this be proof in favor of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, as if whoever had ordered the creation of these symbols needed to read them without modification or destruction? With a more curious eye, one could even venture an analogy between these geometrically perfect lines and the connectors of printed circuits, if so, then it would be appropriate to ask how or what feeds them and what their purpose is. What does the arid plain of Nazca hide from us? Perhaps when the answer is discovered, it will be too late. Centuries after the decline of the Nazca society, a new population rises from the ashes of this mysterious land, the Incas. an indecipherable civilization destined to reign over South American lands for several centuries. The achievements of this glorious empire are well documented, as are their traditions and customs, now banded all over audiovisual media. Needless to say that this ancient population attracts our most visceral curiosity from the first moment we stumble across the singular designs of its artifacts and picturesque architectures. Over the years, we have managed to discover some peculiarities of the complex system of social classes of this population. At the apex of the pyramidal construction resided the Intip Churin, translatable as Son of the Sun, who was the supreme Inca, guarantor of the link with the celestial forces who presided over the continuity of the empire. The priests were next in line, that is, the interpreters of the will of the deities. 
The other members of the ruling class, generically called Inca, the nobles or lords, were in charge of running the imperial structures. The Curacas, the leaders of the conquered ethnic groups, maintained their power and were responsible for the executive control in the individual provinces. But the true strength of the empire were the peasants and Andean villagers gathered in family clans, called Ailu. Each of these clans owned arable land and was protected by an ancestor, often identified with an animal, a rock, a river or a lake. One of the most peculiar characteristics of this society is the fact that an ancient secret language was handed down to the members of the most elite social classes, attributable to the gods of creation. It was strictly forbidden to teach and divulge the secrets of this coded language to members of the lower social classes. Scholars find themselves in front of a mass of knots that are impossible to untie, including the mystery of the origin of this people. Over the centuries, numerous tests and research projects have been carried out, among the most meticulous we can find those of Samuel George Morton, who analysed and measured the dimensions of the skulls of the various Peruvian populations of the time. He immediately noticed that the skull of an Inca elitist appeared more developed. His research was aimed at affirming that human ethnic groups do not derive from the same stock. If these Inca sons of the sun were truly descendants or disciples of some entity, then we should ask ourselves what they did with these glorious and divine lineages. They might have kept the concept of a secret language and developed it in new territories such as genetics and technology. We could find ourselves in front of a host of elitists who have been chosen for generations, leading us to believe in the illusion of living in a democracy, when in reality everything had already been written, or that these semi-gods could be benevolent figures that have for eons been trying to save us or warn us about something greater than we are. The mystery deepens further if we consider Cusco, the famous capital city of the empire and the apex of the Oop arts, since it is itself one. Here there are huge complexes built with blocks of diorite, many of which weigh several tons, modelled with such precision as to be incompatible with the technologies of the time. Although official archaeology attributes the construction of these complexes to the Incas, the difference between the human-sized constructions put in place with the help of mortars and the gigantic puzzle-like compositions that arise nearby raise doubts even among scholars. In the various sites there are also some structures built with measurements different from usual construction standards. The doors are in fact trapezoidal in shape and with a height that is usually around 3 meters and with steps up to 80 centimeters high. Legend has it that this city was built by the first Inca emperor, guided in those lands by the sun god, and that the diorite blocks were shaped using a powerful and mysterious acid, and then transported by creatures from the skies. The Uparts, originating from these most important lands, are the Golden Jets. Small ornamental objects ranging in size from 2 to 5 centimeters that to some may seem like zoomorphic figures, when in reality they are frighteningly similar to modern airplanes. Could they be a sign that something artificial was actually flying in the ancient skies? Illustrations depicting men with bizarre headdresses bent over and intent on piloting what look like jets or rockets are not rare 
and they are often passed off as metaphorical representations of rituals or legends. But what if the truth were much simpler? It's funny to think how such small objects could lead to the cultural collapse of the whole of humanity. If we could prove this thesis once and for all, we would find ourselves faced with an event that would lead us to a global and unanimous philosophical crisis. Before we ask a question, we have to be sure that we are ready to receive the answer. But let's move from Peru to explore the lands and mysteries of ancient India. With its over 1.4 billion inhabitants, this nation forms 18% of the world population. It is considered a real melting pot of numerous religions and cultures, some of the most ancient and important in both the modern and ancient world. Some of its famous temples include the Golden Amritsar Temple, the Meenakshi Temple and the Kornak Sun Temple, the latter famous for being dedicated to the Sun God and having the shape of a 24-wheeled car. They have all been a source of numerous scientific and religious theories. Two characteristic elements of these places of worship are undoubtedly the particular working of the materials, modelled and structured in a way to evolve for even more ancient populations than the Corral and the Egyptians, and above all the actual forms of these structures, with their impossible design and crazy architecture. That there is more than the eye can see is obvious. But what? The most famous Indian Upart is probably the ancient Ashoka Iron Column, located in Delhi, whose main feature is its absence of rust, despite its 1,600 years of age. Scientists have discovered that the iron it is composed of contains higher percentages of phosphorus than the norm. Such a phenomenon is not only unique in history, but even today's metallurgical technology does not allow us to replicate this work. It should also be noted that the Vishnu Padagiri site is located on the Tropic of Cancer and could therefore have been an astronomical observation centre in the Gupta era. The pillar's shadow fell in the direction of Anantasayan Vishu's feet once a year, early in the morning of the summer solstice, on June the 21st. The creation of this monument was therefore necessarily accompanied by highly developed astronomical knowledge. This is just the first of many mysteries surrounding this ancient world treasure. If the ancient pre-Columbian civilizations appear mysterious to you, then I suggest you fasten your seatbelts. The places of worship of this incredible nation are not only limited to sacred palaces and ancient temples, but even reach the depths of the earth and rock through the mysterious sacred caves, which, after all, with such ancient religions and cults, is not surprising. For centuries, every year millions of Hindus have made pilgrimage to the Amarnath Cave, a place of worship devoted to Shiva. The impervious path is several kilometers long and runs along the dangerous, rocky paths of the Himalayas. Unfortunately, deaths and injuries among the devoted travelers are not rare, but the thing that unites all these fallen is their happiness this sacred land is said to be one of the closest places to the gods. This mystical place, more than 3,500 kilometers above sea level, is the testimony of an ancient extraterrestrial presence on Earth, cosmic creatures that have taught us principles and values that are still the cornerstone of our lives today. Legend has it that inside this cave, Shiva himself revealed to Parvati, his wife, the secret behind the creation of the universe and eternal life, also proving his powers by creating an ice stalagmite that melts only in conjunction with certain alignments between the moon and stars. Behind every myth and legend, there is always a kernel of truth, and the facts speak for themselves. Testimonies of various hermits who fall into particular states of trance during the meditations in this sanctuary are not rare, 
as if the residual energies of these beings were still present in the rock. Would a concrete answer explain the numerous apparently divine phenomena in the various world pilgrimage sites if the ancient astronauts had created these places to allow us to heal from evil and ensure survival in extreme cases? Often these sanctuaries are located several kilometers above sea level, as if to protect us. History has already proved how man uses caves and quarries as a natural refuge against nature itself and its forces. One of the more striking examples of this phenomenon is present in the Mustang Caves complex in Nepal. About 10,000 caves dug in the valleys of the district of the same name. Several groups of archaeologists and researchers have explored these overlapping caves and found partially mummified human bodies and skeletons that are at least 3,000 years old. The explorations also led to the discovery of precious Buddhist paintings, sculptures and manuscripts, as well as numerous artefacts dating back to the 12th and 14th centuries. Some historians associate these caves with the celestial kingdom of Shambhala, a divine city with an unknown location whose task is to host the last incarnation of Vishnu, who, at the end of time, will restore order and justice. The historical findings suggest that the inhabitants of these caves were in contact with something else, one or more mystical beings, or rather extraterrestrials, able to pass on to them knowledge and advanced technologies. This is not an absurd assumption, since the only way of access to these caves is through a vertical hole inside the mountain, as if some sort of lift were needed. Once inside these caves, we are greeted by numerous gigantic statues carved into the rock depicting Buddha and other deities. It is common for the monks of these religions to use these cold caves not only as a place of prayer, but as real chambers of sensory deprivation, thus entering a state of complete peace where they are part of the world, and the world is part of them. These prayer techniques allow the human body to abstract itself and split spirit and matter, thus allowing them to communicate with other entities. May this be the secret of true immortality? In the end, if the gods have given us this gift, it could be the way to communicate with the spirits of the astral plane of our ancestors, in such a way as to exploit the knowledge of past errors and help us improve the present. It is no coincidence that these places of worship and these extrasensory experiences are inside the Earth. Under the Earth's surface, far from sunlight, there could be a spiritual place where one can meet alien divinities. After all, the one thing in common between faith and the subsoil is that both are based on elements that are invisible to the human eye. Having a way to divide body and soul would bring perhaps too great a power to mankind. It is probably better that this form of meditation is not accessible to everybody. Perhaps it is the deities themselves who provide a predestination as to who can perform it and who cannot. On the other hand, if they are ancient astronauts, they have seen the future and know that our species would do it without their directives. The connection to the underground world is as strong in these caves as it is for the famous Nazca Lines, placed on a mystical ground and above an underground system of aquifers and caves. How is it possible that people so different and distant in time and in space are so linked to the same underground element? Perhaps the answer to our questions is not in the most distant skies, but in the deepest caves. If we analyze the presence and importance of religions in the world, we can immediately see how for Westerners, the impact of religion and its writings in everyday life is filtered through a veil of taboo, which leads them to analyze the holy scriptures and ancient knowledge with an almost fairy tale eye, reinterpreting the facts narrated with metaphors and allegories. 
This has made it possible to completely distort the original realism of the works that try to convey concrete information and knowledge. Luckily, this sad fate has not touched the Oriental texts that are still read and analysed today for what they really are. In 2015, at the 102nd edition of the prestigious Indian Science Congress, where among the more than 30,000 present there were the Nobel laureates Paul Nurse and Kurt Werthrich, the captain of the Indian Air Force, Anad J. Bodas, gave a lecture pointing out how in the ancient Indian texts, technologically advanced flying objects are transcribed in detail, thus proving the then-considered theories concerning the ancient astronauts. They categorize and describe in detail numerous flying objects used by the gods as means of locomotion or even war machines. As singular as it may seem, and the mere thought of it makes the skin crawl, such objects are present and described, albeit in less detailed forms, in practically all the oldest religions in the world. When the ancient Indian texts speak of Vimana, they go so deeply into the technical aspect that it is difficult, if not impossible, to consider it the result of imagination alone. There are hundreds of texts that describe the construction, the materials, the takeoff procedure, and the type of flight of Vimana. The literal translation of the name, directly from Sanskrit, tells us that V means fly and mana means artificial inhabited place. It is therefore defined as an ancient aerial machine that moves, not dragged by animals nor men, able to carry passengers across the skies, the so-called celestial chariot. In the famous ancient text Vimanika Shastra, the Vimana were described as objects commonly used by gods, semi-gods and kings, and was entirely dedicated to the description of the functioning of such machines. The existence of this shocking manual was revealed to the world only in 1952 by the president of the International Academy of Sanskrit Research, G. R. Josia, who affirms that these manuscripts date back thousands of years and yet their contents, however, brilliantly express modern concepts of aeronautics. The Vimana are divided into distinct categories. Shakuna Vimana aircraft, about 24 meters high and 17 meters long and wide, also exhibit numerous parts equipped with pistons and pumps, technologies not present at the time. Sunda Vimana, with a conical appearance, this aircraft has a base of about 10 meters and a height of 15, and would be able to bend the currently known laws of physics. Tripura Vimana, an amphibious vehicle also suitable for flight, 100 meters long and 7 meters high. It has a form that is reminiscent of a modern day submarine. Finally, we find the Rukma Vimana, more than 30 meters high and with a base diameter of 300 meters, it is composed of five floors, equipped with housing for passengers, and consists of two long vertical ducts, with fans to absorb the air and channel it to obtain a propulsive thrust. The manuscript describes in detail electrical components such as capacitors and circuits as well as photovoltaic panels. In 2017, at the University of California, various aerospace engineers joined forces and created a model of this type of Vimana designed only using the knowledge written in this text, and they performed numerous calculations and tests 
to verify if indeed such an object was able to fly. These examinations were made by inserting the created model inside a sealed chamber with a continuous flow of air to simulate high altitude currents. The results of these incredible experiments are surprising. The model, created exclusively following the constructive indications reported in the Vimanika Shastra, has a surprising stability in flight that can adapt to the variations of air currents. Being such a sensational discovery, it is not surprising that it has passed under the radar since it totally revolutionizes ancient and modern history. This knowledge in the wrong hands could lead to general panic and mass hysteria. The Vimana are the vehicles of the gods, or rather of the ancient astronauts. The materials with which they are created and coated are the same used by NASA for their space missions with rockets and satellites. Reading the ancient texts, it is clear that this information does not come directly from the author of the Vimanika Shastra, but it seems they are notions dictated and imparted to him by someone from a higher hierarchy, suggesting that the secrets of these technologies should not have reached the ear of the people. Can you see a pattern emerging? What if these heavenly gods were the same ones who helped the Inca develop a secret language? The speed of transport of these aircraft and the simple fact that they fly is enough to explain how so many ancient cultures and religions share basic concepts and similar elements in their pantheon. With the Vimana, the gods made sure they could move in a short time from one part of the world to the other and be able to govern man. Throughout India we can find majestic temples the famous stupas, which are often referred to and recognized with a second name, Vimana. So it is self-evident where the ancient architects drew inspiration for the construction of these works. In the Indian Vedic writings, there are depictions and meticulous descriptions of battles in the skies between gods, demons and the respective Vimana. It is therefore logical that a doubt about our historical knowledge begins to form, especially since these battles are common in every mythology and in every religion. With an accurate and literal analysis of the sacred scriptures, we can also notice a macabre detail. The famous semigods are born from the will of these celestial beings, who, having descended from their Vimana, decide to create a new progeny with humanity, whose children are none other but giants. It is therefore certain that not only the first contact between humans and extraterrestrials has already taken place, but that the gods have been a fundamental part in our evolution as a species. The biblical verse of Genesis, according to which man is made in the image and likeness of God, would therefore be truer than ever. The Christian Bible and the Holy Scriptures connected to it also contain descriptions and detailed episodes of flying objects. These passages have been brought to the attention of the Church and the Pope, who commented by affirming the obviousness of the encounter between man and celestial deities in the past. There are therefore analyses on the so-called Ruach and the Kavod, the biblical Vimana. Their names can be adapted and translated as traveling from one place to another in a heavy carriage. Before the Bible, before Hinduism and before the Incas, there was a civilization between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers. Our journey is about to end in Mesopotamia. What we consider to be the first urban civilization endowed with writing and laws was born in today's southeastern Iraq, more than 4,000 years before the birth of Christ, and in the land between the two rivers, the Sumerians settled. This pioneering civilization may seem like an open book to us, 
as it is one of the first historical topics that are faced by children at school. But it isn't so easy to summarize the historical events that characterized the Sumerian civilization, especially their most ancient phases. Sumerian is an isolated language, that is, it is not related to any other known language. It is also known for being the first language to use the subject-object-verb order. The first inscriptions are in pictographic form, only over time will cuneiform writing be formed. Many Sumerian texts that have been found refer to scientific laws and essays that include advanced concepts of subjects such as mathematics, astronomy and medicine. The astrologer Carl Sagan, in his book Intelligent Life in the Universe, argues that humans around the 4th millennium BC came into contact with a non-human civilization in the ancient and shining city of Eridu. It is therefore likely that the merits for the first literary work in human history, the ancient epic poem, the Epic of Gilgamesh, can be attributed to this mysterious alien civilization, which thus inspired the facts transcribed by the Sumerians. It is important to underline how from this poem, Verses, plots and characters have been stolen and quoted in all the religions and cultures of the world, starting from the Christian Bible. The epic is a story about the human condition and its limitations, life, death, friendship and more generally a coming of age story about the hero's awakening to wisdom. The first part tells of the deeds of Gilgamesh and his friend Enkidu, who triumph over the giant Humbaba and the celestial bull. The latter hurled at them by the goddess Ishtar, whose advances had been rejected by the hero. The story changes direction after Enkidu's death, a punishment inflicted by the gods for the insult they had received. Gilgamesh then embarks on the quest for immortality, reaching the end of the world where the immortal Utanapishti resides, revealing to him that he will never get what he seeks, but teaches him the story of the flood that he can pass on to the rest of mortals. As the Assyrologist George Smith pointed out in 1872, the epic poem mentions a catastrophic flood as does the Bible and many other religions in the world. It is therefore assumed that all similar events narrated after the epic are copied from it. There are those who argue that the sources of the epic story of Gilgamesh are not to be found on earth but in the sky, through the constellations and stars. Probably the mythical hero was not only an idol for the Sumerian people but also for someone else. Among the hundreds of tablets found, there are many about the Pantheon and the Sumerian deities, the Anunnaki. The name Anunnaki can be translated as the sons of heaven and earth and refers to all divine beings worshipped by the Sumerians, that is, those who endowed the human species with the intellect and knowledge of the heavenly gods who descended from heaven. To better understand the real history of the facts, it is necessary to quote the famous Azerbaijani writer and scholar Zechariah Sitchin, supporter of the theories concerning ancient astronauts and a first contact between humans and aliens. His book, The Twelfth Planet, is perhaps among the most important works of modern culture concerning antiquity. Sitchin, in his work, is not alone, 
In fact, we can find him associated with free thinkers and writers of the caliber of Erich von Daniken, author of the bestseller The Extraterrestrials Will Return, and of the Italian Mauro Biglino, expert in Hebrew and author of The Naked Bible. All these minds agree in making parallels between the facts reported by the Sumerians and those described in the passages of the Jewish and Christian Bibles. Sitchin states that from Sumerian cosmology it can be deduced that the solar system would have a tenth planet. This planet, following an elliptical orbit, would re-enter the solar system once every 3,600 years. Also, at the time he wrote the book, Pluto was considered the ninth planet, so adding the additional celestial body, we reach 12. This planet is called Nibiru by the Sumerian people, while, in Babylonian mythology, it is associated with the god Marduk from the 18th century BC, principal deity of the land of Babylon. Nibiru had a catastrophic impact with another planet that no longer exists, called Tiamat, located between Mars and Jupiter. The impact of the two bodies therefore created both the planet Earth and the asteroid belt. Tiamat would be hit first by one of Nibiru's seven moons, breaking in two. One of these two portions would later become the Earth with its moon, and would be pushed into its current position by another impact with a Nibiru moon. Later, the other half, hit by Nibiru itself, would have given life to the asteroid belt. The remaining debris from the impact would have given rise to the comets. Nibiru survived, but damaged by the last collision, remained with only five moons. The technologically advanced race of humanoid extraterrestrials that inhabited Nibiru, called Anunnaki in Sumerian mythology, also appear in other mythologies and in the Bible with the name of Elohim. They arrived on the earth 450,000 years ago in search of minerals and in particular gold that according to historical evidence and data they found in Africa. For the Anunnaki, this gold was essential for life and for the repair of the now rarefied and damaged atmosphere of their home planet. With these powers at stake, everything slowly comes to a head and the answers to the doubts previously posed about out-of-time objects and ancient civilizations slowly begin to clear up. The Anunnaki would then have settled in Mesopotamia and founded the splendid city called Eridu, a city that is often associated with the biblical concept of the Garden of Eden. The first astronauts did not come alone, but rather were accompanied by a host of servants to extract gold from the mines, the so-called Ijiji, who, however, after centuries of humiliation and merciless slavery, instigated a bloody insurrection against their despotic sovereigns. This clash unfortunately led to the almost complete extinction of the Ijiji race, thus leaving the gods without manpower. At this point, the Anunnaki found themselves forced to create a new species of life, intelligent enough to know how to support them and work, but harmless enough to avoid a new rebellion. Often in the stories we read of gods, they come down from heaven and fall in love with earthly maidens. This is nothing more than a fictionalized metaphor to sweeten the pill on the truth of the facts. The human race was artificially created and with it the vegetative ecosystem capable of sustaining us. The Anunnaki would have genetically modified Homo erectus by combining their DNA with ours. The first experiments were none other than the biblical giants called Nephilim. The first Homo sapiens was therefore, quoting the ancient tablets of the city of Nineveh, Adamu. The Anunnaki may therefore not be benevolent entities, but manipulative creatures disguised as divinities, 
who would thus have seized our trust and would have provided us with iron-bound behavioural and moral laws to follow. The Biblical Genesis, as well as the whole Old Testament, copies in fact all its main information from the much more ancient Sumerian Genesis of Eridu. In the text we read that the Creator Gods, He who belongs to the heavens, Enlil, God of the atmosphere, and Enki, God of wisdom, created Homo sapiens by placing it in a comfortable habitat that is suitable for life. Moreover, the royalty of the Sumerian kings descends from a preferred lineage. In fact, the hybrid man-alien kings are not described as representations or reincarnations of the Anunnaki, but as intermediaries between the two parts. During the centuries of forced labour and slavery, the human population grows dramatically, and with this growth, the desire for independence also increases. The insurrections increase dramatically until the Anunnaki decide to drown the world. In fact, the great universal flood happened precisely in concomitance with the approach of Nibiru's orbit to Earth's. The only divinity opposed to this massacre was Enki, who provided men with an advanced vimana, capable of providing them with refuge for the duration of the cataclysm. This fact is also narrated in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Sitchin states that the major megalithic works scattered around the globe, such as the Great Pyramid, were built with many functions, mainly astronomical, astrological and related to the calendar. Two other sites, Machu Picchu and Bad Tibira, would have been metalworking centres. Sitchin also argues that the Mesoamerican and South American civilizations are derived from the Sumerian and Akkadian ones, and that the two main Mexican, Azteca Maya, and Peruvian, Inca Nazca deities, Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha, described by Amerindian myths as tall, of fair skin and with a long blonde or white beard, therefore characteristics attributed to Europeans, were two Anunnaki. Ningish Zida and Ishkur, who moved with some Sumerians and Africans to the new continent to exploit the existing deposits, such as those of the Urubamba Valley. In the engravings depicting the gods, we often see objects that recall the forms of the solar system, such as the Sun and the other planets, with the addition of Nibiru. As it is assumed that the deities known as Abgal, the seven wise men, often depicted as hybrids between men and fish, are nothing more than the ancient stylizations of spacesuits and technological equipment. It would be these wise men who chose the dynasties that were to govern humans by generating human-alien hybrids. With modern technological innovations, one doubt should clearly arise. What if these seven wise men were actually artificial intelligences? It is enough to reflect for just a moment to understand how much this question is not so far-fetched. Species infinitely less technological than the Elohim or Anunnaki use algorithms and AI to help us simplify everyday life, to recommend products that are useful for us.
Today's AI creates works of art, generates encrypted coding, can destroy computer systems and can even help us in space missions. We can therefore also attach to this concept the thesis of Francis Crick, the discoverer of the DNA structure and directed panspermia. The concept behind the word panspermia predicts that the fundamental ingredients of life have spread throughout the universe using comets or fragments of inorganic matter ejected from rocky bodies as a means of locomotion and which have functioned as a vector to transport life onto other worlds. The directed panspermia, hypothesized by Crick and confirmed by the Anunnaki artificial intelligences, states that Life is spread through a voluntary act, probably the result of an intelligent extraterrestrial civilization that has decided, for reasons that we are not given to know but only to hypothesize, to sow the seed of life on other worlds. But what did the Anunnaki do with it? Sitchin theorizes that around the year 2024 BC, a nuclear war broke out between different factions of Anunnaki extraterrestrials, whose two opposing factions were commanded by the brothers Enki and Enlil. And that the radioactive fallout of the bombs exploded in the Sinai Peninsula, the evil wind that would destroy not only the city of Ur, according to what he would have recounted in The Lament of Ur, but would have repercussions on almost all of Mesopotamia, causing many victims of radiation poisoning and the exodus of many Anunnaki. The surviving gods left the knowledge and culture to humans, and instructed them to create temples, such as ziggurats and pyramids, coinciding with the stars, in order to one day lead the Anunnaki back to Earth. The next time you look at the night sky or enter a museum of ancient history, remember, in our galaxy alone, there are about 300 billion stars, among which at least five billion solar systems similar to ours. Maybe not all of them have a suitable planet for the development of organic organisms placed at the right distance from their sun. It is therefore calculated that of these 5 billion, at least 10 million could have these characteristics. And among these 10, at least 1,000 could have seen the development of a bacterial type of life, which, in the worst hypothesis, on at least 50 planets, could have evolved into multicellular life forms and intelligent organisms. From this it has been calculated that in the worst case scenario, the possibility that technologically advanced civilizations and alien multicellular organisms exist in our galaxy is equivalent to about 0.1%. That doesn't seem such a large percentage, but if multiplied by the approximately 500 billion galaxies that are estimated to exist, it becomes, in the most pessimistic hypothesis, 50,000 planets. 50,000 technologically advanced civilizations currently existing in the universe. The next time you look up at the night sky, remember that maybe somebody is looking down at you too.